G'day pals, welcome to a new video. It's the end of the year and I've been working on the game that I'm working on, Insignia, for quite some time. And I thought it would be helpful just to talk a little bit about my current headspace, where I'm at with the project, my experiences in the last few weeks, and the positives and negatives of kind of like, yeah, my, where I'm at, uh, while also doing some work. So, uh, get ready for my uh, devlog ramble. Let's go, shall we? All right, what you're looking at is uh, something from chapter two of Insignia. This is part of the dungeon. I've currently got a screenshot or a, a mock-up screenshot of an area in the dungeon. So there is a level chunk that I'm working on currently. And it's one of about eight different pieces of this dungeon. And I've been working on different parts of this chapter for the last six months, uh, effectively since like May, since the end of May or the start of June. I've been chipping away at Insignia's second chapter. The first half of that includes a town and the second half is a dungeon experience. And it's taken me rounds and rounds of um, approaching that from different angles. I did some enemy design at the beginning of the year. I did some uh, world building and town environment art and just building out scenes and characters after that. I did some refinement on certain systems for dialogue and then I started writing a lot of dialogue. And then I worked on tile sets and I built out this uh, environment tile set here. I've been playing around with dungeon mechanics. So the actual puzzle mechanics and, and progression, the scenario, how it takes place over the areas. I worked on a mini game to flash out the side quests. And then I've returned back to the dungeon and have started coalescing some of the mechanics that you'll be experiencing that include puzzles and combat. One of Insignia's kind of selling points that I'm trying to really hone in on here is that I want to weave the level designs in such a way that they feel really well integrated. So the mechanics that you unlock need to feel like they really make sense to the enemies that you face. And those things need to feel like they fit in the environment that they exist in which includes platforming challenges and just general uh, scenery, you know, the world building, the lore around how the enemies look and feel and their identities inside the space. It's really important to me. I found myself yesterday or the day before working on this chunk and it, this started as a, actually a, a puzzle piece. It started as a platforming challenge that involves a swinging vine that just takes place in this section. And I built out each, I built out, you know, each of these chunks, just one platforming challenge at a time using this mechanic, because I was trying to find the edges of the mechanic, you know, what it's useful for, how I can turn it on its head, different use cases. And then I decided to start putting them in a sequence that you would play them in. And so the story started to fit into you know, if we're going to this scene first, what's happening in this scene? Is there any plot stuff that's moving forward in this particular room? And now that I'm at this stage where it's concrete, it becomes really, really obvious what needs to be in this space. So this takes place before you access the key item or the, 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 the collectible in this dungeon that changes the mechanics. As a unit of level design, it's really important that in this first part of the dungeon, not just this room, but the, the, the rooms around it, that I am hinting at the mechanic that you'll be unlocking. I need to show you the need of what you're going to be getting so that when you get it, it feels like, oh, this is gonna solve those problems that I had earlier. So it's not that you can't move through the space, but it becomes a lot easier once you have this thing. I have been struggling on things like enemy design. You know, before I, ha before I had the mechanics for the dungeon figured out, it's hard to know what the enemies need to be because they need to fit, right? All of these things need to interlock. And so earlier on in the year, before I'd done all this experimentation and, and ideating on what I wanted for this dungeon, designing enemies was really difficult. I was working on systems and mechanics and I have plenty of, of things that enemies can do, but in terms of like how they fit into the puzzles and when, 
when is appropriate to fight this kind of enemy, that kind of thing, uh, was really difficult. But it just so happened as I was designing this space that we came across this little tunnel, this passage. And I'll give you a little bit of a hint that the power that you get halfway through the dungeon allows you to manipulate where things are in space. It's kind of like gravity, entropy, um, that's the idea anyway. I was thinking out loud to chat on the stream, you know, we have these nice set pieces. Now we need some enemy encounters, you know, to pad out the sections. And ideally I'd really want the enemy encounters to be baked into the spaces in a way that really makes sense. So if there's a platforming challenge, can I create an enemy that augments that platforming challenge, makes it a bit difficult or changes how you approach it. But even outside of that, there are still opportunities to have areas where you fight an enemy for its own sake. And it's just an opportunity to, to engage with a piece of level design that has some more variety, right? It's not just platforming over and over again, you break it up. So we have this corridor and I was thinking, well, what if there's an enemy that, that is easier once you have the power to pull things out of the ground or out of the air, uh, but it's still something that you can fight without the power. Chat was giving some ideas and what if it was this and what if it was this? And I, I thought to myself, well, what if it was like a burrowing enemy, something that's underground that makes it difficult to pass and has a, like a hitbox that runs along the ground. Maybe it even dives out of the ground. Um, kind of like a, like, a, like a worm or a mole or even something like a shark. And we had ideas of like a piranha that like eats dirt or like swims through dirt, something like that. And I ended up settling on this idea of like a mole. I was like, oh yeah, that's a kind of cool idea. And the crazy thing is I had already had this idea like months and months and months ago and I had totally forgotten. I just want to prove to myself that I'm not lying here. You can see when I opened up this document yesterday, you can see right in the top here that says moles with a question mark. I came to the document and I was like, oh yeah, what about this idea? Moles. <laughs> and it's right there. It's already written there. So I must have stumbled on the idea, but I don't think I really understood a way to make it work at the time. It's interesting because we've come at the idea from a different angle, right? We have a need here for an enemy that fits this exact space. And now that it's kind of like ticking two boxes, right? It fits in the world. That's what this document is. This was more like things that you find in a forest, forest dwelling animals, um, maybe even deep forest, kind of like, you know, living mushrooms and stuff like that. But moles is the first thing on here. So it's a nice little bit of validation that I can come to the same idea twice. So the idea is mechanically that there is a line, an edge, and the edge represents a space that the mole inhabits, right? It's just like the range. I'm not sure yet what the behavior will be, whether it's cycling or stops and moves or however it is, but we know that there'll be a range and that range will represent the a span of ground, essentially. What I like about this is that uh, because it's kind of like a corridor, you won't really be able to jump over the space very easily. You can't really like circumvent it. You have to pass through it, which I like. And the idea here is that the mole sort of like pops out of the ground and creates like this whirlwind hitbox as it sort of um, burrows out. There are a few ideas here kind of um, from an energy perspective that came to mind. You know, one being like a drill, another being like a piranha. Well, I'm not going to spell this correctly. That's definitely wrong. Is that right? Piranha? The idea of a piranha sort of leaping out of the void and chomping is kind of interesting. The idea of a drill and also a shark. The idea of having some sort of visual element above the surface that represents where the thing is and where it's going to come from. Telegraphing is really important in enemy design. And so uh, even if, you know, at first I wasn't thinking of actually making it like a shark, the shark idea was sort of there. You could think of it like any kind of burrowing animal as well. It's very common. It's a, something you would see in Looney Tunes as well. Bugs Bunny is burrowing around or something like that. You would see the, the mounds of disturbed dirt. So I had this idea for a mole and um, very quickly I was thinking about how we could augment this in a way that didn't make it just feel like a mole because it's a fantasy game. There should be elements of variation on these things or at least something that just gives it its own original twist that still feels like it, it's part of the world. And so this idea of the mole having sort of like a fin 
so that when it's digging underground, you see the fin there. I think that's, I don't know, it's kind of a fun twist on the idea because it evokes the shark. You know what it is, but you've never seen it in this context before. So that was kind of where we went for the design. I just on the topic of design, as I'm working out this enemy, I'm already thinking about the kind of enemy class that it is. I have different sizes of enemies in my game. There are practical reasons why they're not all really complicated. Some of them are designed to be simpler, that are not that hard to dispense. And they, they do kind of like one thing. You could call them like critters in the game. So the hedgehog in chapter one is one of them. And the mole here in chapter two is probably going to be the equivalent. So it's got one kind of gimmick move that you learn and that you get good at sort of anticipating and dealing with. They're also designed, like these kinds of enemies, I, I'm designing them from like a silhouette perspective to be quite small. So here is the sprites that I'm currently working in. And you can see they kind of fit in this lovely 32 by 32 space. You know, it's like right around here. Uh, that's 32 by 32, right? So the hitbox is probably gonna be about this big. That places them pretty squarely at about the same like surface area as Armin. They're like a they're like a little stockier, a little shorter. And it makes them kind of like perfect for the the hitbox that comes out as you attack. Right? They're they're very easy to hit. They don't they don't move in unpredictable ways. Anything that's like square or like beach ball sized is good for a simple kind of enemy. And so from a visual design standpoint, I was conscious of that even as I was designing this thing. So the idea of having its shapes be quite simple, right? We've got like a few, like a couple of circles really. And that's kind of like the entire silhouette. You know, maybe there's, you know, kind of bits coming off here and there. That was how I got here. And I was trying really hard to, to keep it. You can see the circles that I'm drawing here, trying to keep it within a certain contained space. But ultimately uh, it needs to look good in the game and so I didn't want to spend too much time here like I've got a pretty clear idea about what the base concept is and how you'll interact with this enemy before you get the power you'll be doing some kind of um, maybe you'll be waiting for like a, m a moment of vulnerability maybe it it breaches the surface lands on the ground for a bit sits there and then tunnels back under and so you have to attack it when it's sitting around uh, so you'll have to wait for that while dodging the first attack Later on, you'll be able to pull it out of the ground using the magic spell, even while it's in this state. And so it becomes trivial to beat at that point. But prior to that, uh, this is kind of like the core image, right? This is like the thing that the whole enemy hinges on, this idea of it being under the surface and then it breaches the surface with a hitbox. So that's what I designed. Um, I, I basically took this thing and I was like, okay, I'll just take a mock screenshot of this space. This is the same area as here. And I'll just, you know, draw some dirt over the top of my tile set. Um, I'm actually going to be like, my tile set currently doesn't support this dirt being on the ground. It auto tiles with just grass there, but I'm going to change it up to have this dirt for, for other reasons as well. In my last video, you guys were, many of you were suggesting that the acid pools didn't make a lot of sense to have the grass sitting at the bottom of the pools, because why wouldn't it have eroded? Uh, makes total sense and um, the reason why I didn't do that is because of the auto tiling rules that I'd already implemented so between that and this I've got a good reason now to go back and just tweak those a little bit to allow me to have this bare dirt in spots so here the bare dirt will uh, will indicate the region that this little guy can zoom around in so you already get some sort of telegraphing once you're familiar with the enemy that ah this is the area where the enemy can move around in. That's where I can expect to have to be on my guard. So I started with just a silhouette. Um, what's really important to me here is the silhouette. I've talked about this in previous videos where I want to really be focusing on shapes because in motion, your eyes are, you know, they're looking to separate objects in the scene. The first thing is, okay, how do I identify this enemy versus other enemies? You know, is there a sort of, shape that I can give it that that leads back into its character design that feels unique. It was very easy for this to look a lot like the hedgehog in chapter one. You know, I, I had this idea, especially with this like beach ball thing going on. 
uh, where like it's mostly the head and then like a snout and then you know some maybe some limbs yeah, already basically at the hedgehog that's the chapter one hedgehog pretty much and so you know cleaning this up you end up with something very similar to this so I was trying to differentiate the the actual silhouette and that's kind of where the where this shark fin came in like the first thing was you know something like this and then okay well we need to give it a few more keyframes and something that's indicative of a keyframe that will that will read well when we're at like a break point in the interaction one thing that's really critical to me as i'm animating these characters and drawing these characters is the idea of maximizing the visual communication so that the player can read what's happening while also getting the most energy out of the actual you know out of the motion in the animation i've always been quite um, comfortable and excited by the idea of understanding motion like the principles of mechanics and how motion is transferred and how that's communicated visually. But one thing that's really important with this kind of design is more than just the motion, right? Because this is not just an animation, it's, a, it's an enemy that you fight. It has to be really clear what it is, where the dangerous spots are, and just being able to recognize the points, the break points in the fight. So is the enemy vulnerable now? Am I clear to attack it? Will I get hurt if I touch it? And there's kind of like a language that needs to be developed around that visually. Like, what does it look like if an enemy will hurt you when it touches you? And how do you make these those enemies distinct? And there's an aspect of this visual storytelling that I've noticed recently. I picked it up recently from a kind of an odd source. Um, it's actually a game that is in beta right now called DNF Duel. It's a fighting game. It's an anime fighting game and it's the animation and visuals are done by arc system works which make lots of anime fighting games this ordinarily you know you would think is a it should be common and it's not that special but there are some things about this game and the way it animates that have really caught my attention and i think there's a bit of hype building around this game i think the reason in addition to the character designs is just how well it's animated so i want to share with you just as I watch this, how I'm noticing the importance of keyframes for visual storytelling and communication. So for a fighting game, hitboxes are really important, where the enemy is, what they're doing, and also just how they look when they're doing what they do. The supers are really cool. I just want you to watch it and just consider how easy it is to track the energy, the character moments that are happening in this thing. That little sequence is so strong visually, stylistically. It feels really, really readable. So there's a lot going on here. So we pull into this new scene, character jumps up. We get a flash, we see a dragon. Dragon jumps at the camera and then the camera turns. Dragon's in the sky. The girl's on top of the dragon now and we're looking up. There's a big beam. The opponent is like engulfed in the beam. We see a foot step off something, and then here comes the character. Nice big close up on their face, and then whoosh, impact. That is such a masterclass in storyboarding, right? From like an actual scene blocking perspective. If we just watch it back again, even though there's drastic motion that's happening. We're still getting these beats where we see the characters' faces. We see like really clear keyframes, right? Like this shot is so cool. It's it's so memorable. This like vortex and the characters being like absorbed in, in this, you know, massive power. And then the presence of mind to just show the foot stepping off, right? Like we're being prepared, we're being telegraphed. The fact that the characters now jumped off of the dragon and then rather than then showing them, you know, jump into the air and then start descending, we cut right to like essentially the, the, the like victim's perspective looking up at the character who's coming down at them. And that gives us the opportunity to see like their face. What an incredible moment. And then there to have like the, the anticipation again of like the sword coming down, the close up on the sword descending. 
makes this frame, right? The frames where we don't really see much in terms of characters. Because we've already seen the character's face, this thing, which is mostly just visual effects, has a huge amount of payoff, right? Like we really feel the energy because we've seen the character foundations to back it up. We've looked at the aggression in the character's face. We've seen the sword start to come down. We've already been prepared for the implications, like kind of like visuo narratively, I just coined that term, uh, of what's happening. And so when we do have just like a big light explosion, we can fill the gaps in the stuff that we can't see because we've already seen it in the previous frames. And the way that relates to any of this stuff mostly has to do with keyframe based animation. Now I mostly do straight ahead animation. I mostly animate frame to frame because I feel like the motion, it's just more natural to me to animate motion that way. But I, I think from this character onwards or yeah, from here, I'm going to put a little bit more of a focus on those keyframes because I think it's really important, especially for enemy design, to be able to look at a frame and understand what's happening. And it also means that I can sort of de-emphasize the detail on frames that are high in energy and motion if I'm able to capture before and after really clear keyframes. So that's kind of what I'm working on. I was going to be working while I was explaining all this, but I kind of just got carried away and was talking a lot. Um, so in this process, you can see the iteration here. You can see the, the levels of detail increasing. Um, before I had really figured out the proportions and where the, the limbs were, I drew this thing, you know, evenly. You can see it's sort of like symmetrical, but I think what would be nice is to have it be a little bit facing towards the camera sort of like the way Armin is, where we've got just a little bit of, of, uh, of perspective. Uh, this is my favorite frame so far. It's obviously the, the last frame that I did. So, you know, you can imagine there'd be a frame where we've got the, the mole kind of like breaching the surface and then it would be like a big smear and then like the hitbox sort of going out. And then we would have frame like this hanging for a little bit to denote the fact that, oh, the enemy's like lost its momentum now, and now it's about to land and become vulnerable. That's really, really important to me so that you understand now's my chance. Now I have to attack it. So maybe like from here, I'll do a, a frame of like the, the enemy sitting, you know, maybe I'll just draw, we know how big it is, but I'll just copy and paste this for reference, you know, a slump, Maybe with the, with the arms out is really, really important. I think the head being down and the feet out in front are really kind of like, kind of cute, like almost like Kirby sitting down. So we'll just block that out, put the frame in front. I like to block these, these out because, you know, the silhouettes are really important as you've seen in my character, character study videos. If you can recognize it when it's a blob, then you can recognize it when it's lovely and detailed. I think this is going to go a bit higher up. Maybe this, limb can be a bit more this way. I'm really happy with how the actual character's design came out. I was really unsure about how I was going to make it look unique. I've got a lot of brown enemies in the first chapter and I just thought, well, you know, I can't just have it be another orangey brown enemy with fur. So how can I make this distinct in a way that doesn't break the actual visual kind of like consistency of the game. And uh, I was working with this flesh tone partly because, you know, naked mole rats, they have those, uh, they're like all skin, you know, they live in these subterranean places and they, they don't see a lot of light. So they're all very pale and they've got blue eyes or they're, they're blind. And uh, yeah, I was like, okay, so maybe the, the flesh tones are a good place to start. But it wasn't until we added the, the fin, this like metal kind of mohawk that I think it really started to come together. One thing that's really important to me when I'm working on stuff like this is the actual breaking of the shapes internally. So I've talked about this in previous videos, of course, you know, looking at, at this frame, it's really clear where the arm is relative to the head, where the head is relative to the body depth. So we've got like a, like a knee or something like underneath here. And then the foot 
coming forward again, like the separation in the shapes and the clarity of the contrast. So the points that we really want to look at are much darker and much more high contrast where they need to be to secure this visually as something that we can recognize. I think in the, in the previous example, you know, I was playing around with shapes. I had something that was more fish like, and uh, it was just harder to sort of read. And then here in this first example, even, you know, I really didn't have a lot of form that was distinct, right? There were like, there's like one shape here and then there's sort of like a second shape that's a bit sort of confused. There's not really, we don't really know where one thing ends and another begins. And then the hand, whereas I think this is much clearer. To me, what's really important also is the use of negative space. So this lovely empty area helps support the high contrast areas because if you have a space with nothing in it, and a space with something in it, now your eyes know what to look at. Versus if this was all noisy, if there was stuff everywhere on this thing, it's harder now to focus on one thing because you, you don't know where you should be looking versus where you shouldn't. So what I'll do here is I'll separate this. So we've got the head and then the arm separately. And then I wanna use another darker tone maybe underneath here to allow me to create an internal shape for the legs. Mm, I don't think I'll be able to fit the uh, the tail in in a way that works. Little stars. Oh, he's dazed. And I don't usually spend a lot of time with this kind of UI. I think, you know, it would depend on other systems that I put in the game. Like I might actually make a dizzy system and I would probably have that be shared across different, different monsters. But for the sake of this... Uh, little demonstration <laughs> there you go now you know it's time oh, we could give it a little more character we could do something like having its its arm up up to its head I don't know to what extent that'll be very uh, it might be a bit confusing to look at if we can't tell what the arm is there oh. <laughs> very cute Maybe, maybe uh, the only way to put him into this state is to parry when he comes out of the surface. So if he jumps up and you parry, you sort of like bounce him away and then he lands and then he's, then you have to sort of chase after him and hit him while he's rubbing his head. I like that idea. I'm going to keep that. At the moment, things are going really well with Insignia, probably better than they've gone in the last six or eight months of this year. The, the first half of working on chapter two was quite difficult. The, the chapter itself, just in terms of the sheer amount of content and systems and mechanics has just, it was definitely something that I, I struggled uh, synthesizing, right? Getting all, the, all, getting all of the pieces fitting together and understanding what shape the pieces needed to be in the first place. But I feel like now I'm at a point where things are starting to come together a little more easily, right? Some uh, puzzle pieces expose the shape that other puzzle pieces need to be, right? It's like when you're doing a jigsaw, you can see what's missing because what's there is already set in stone. So I'm starting to feel that happening, which is a really good feeling. As far as like when this will be released, chapter two, I don't intend on releasing as an entire demo like I did with chapter one, but I will be considering having some sort of closed beta test for the chapter uh, for patrons and uh, maybe subscribers of the Twitch stream. I'm not sure. It won't be the entire experience, but it may be certain mechanics, encounters, enemies, that kind of thing. From this point on, my plan is to continue working on the game as I have been until it's content complete. So chapter two, three, four, and five, I'll be working on primarily alone. Um, I do have plans and an interest in building a team around me, but I think I may leave that sort of phase of development until after at least the first four chapters are content complete, whether or not they're polished is another story. As I sort of climb over the hill of chapter two and start heading down the hill and things are becoming a little bit easier. I'm sort of filled with this like renewed confidence that I've had in the past that left me a little bit this year that everything is coming together and that I have the skill and the direction 
to get it there as long as I can maintain the stamina. And as long as I have your support and as long as things continue as they are, which they show no sign that they won't, uh, I think this game's going to be really good when it comes out. I, I think it takes time and it's not good the first time I do anything. Everything takes iteration, but that's game development. And what's really important is that I have the patience to let it be bad the first time. You know, make the, the iterations that I need to make and then recognize that it's actually closer. It actually does get closer to the vision. And for me this year, the real lesson or the, the, the thing that I've been trying really hard to keep in my mind is that you can't wait to feel good before working on it if the thing that's stopping you from feeling good is the current state of the game. That is to say, if I'm anxious about where things are going, the only way to resolve that anxiety is to do it, is to make it and um, prove to myself that it's not going bad and that I'm heading there, I'm, I'm on the path. And I feel like I am. I, this is something that I'm saying for me more than for you, but hopefully there is some sort of uh, uh, transfer effect <laughs> that you can take this confidence and, and apply it to whatever scenario you're going through. Because even if you're not making a game or if you are, I'm sure that you're experiencing some aspect of this and it doesn't matter what the scale of it is, if you keep moving, eventually you'll get where you need to go. So that's it. That's all this has been. This was a nice little reflection of where things are going. Hopefully uh, you're having a safe and happy holiday. I don't know if I'll make another video. I said that last time. I don't know if I'll make another one before, <laughs> before the new year, but uh, stay tuned. And uh, thanks for watching. And thanks most especially to the patrons and Twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project Insignia. To find out more, click the links in the description below. And uh, if you like this video, tell YouTube by clicking the like button, and then YouTube will tell me, and then I'll make more videos. That's nice. Thanks again, and uh, until next time.